Hey, uh, one thing I wanted to point out real quick before we move forward is the fact that Bob said get a good acquisition. A lot of people are looking for a good deal. They want a good deal, and they think at the end. It all starts at the beginning, and he had a great acquisition with that property. I thought that was really insightful. So just want to point that out. All right. Uh, Taylor and I are going to get into the home ownership pathway program that Uptown Properties offers. Uh, we, again, are investment-minded, like Bob said, and we are huge advocates for owning real estate. And this is a program that we offer to our tenants. Uh, Terry actually has something to say real quick. Oh, yeah. Awesome. We'll hold up for a second. Terry's going to come up here. And Cameron. Uh, hi, everybody. Is this okay? Hi, everyone. I'm Terry Anderson with Lawyer's Title. And this is Cameron. And Cameron Starr, you won't forget that. He's our technology specialist. So if you're needing any help at all with your technology, he helped tonight with the, helping um, get this all together. And we are here for you. We support you. And we have all kinds of tools for you. So I wanted to thank Uptown Properties. This was their vision to have this. And we're so grateful that we get to be a part of it. So thanks for coming. This is not for a credit hour. So that's good. You don't have to worry about staying on the whole time. You're just going to get great information. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Terry and Cameron. Yeah, I just want to reiterate that lawyer's title is a fantastic title company. I've worked with them for, I think, four years now, and I don't plan on switching anytime soon. So, all right, Taylor's going to get us started. Yes, sir. So thank you all for coming to the Westside Investors Network today. Uh, once again, you know, it's just good to have you here online and all the above. So big thanks to everyone helping out. Uh, big thanks to Terry and Laura's title. Uh, so who, who we are, Uptown Properties, you know, we've been around um, since 2010. And, you know, we're small and growing business. At this point, we're a little bit um, more perhaps medium size, but we have about 750 units under management when it comes to property management. Uh, we also have a brokerage piece. We have a syndication arm. So we give opportunity to invest into real estate in a little bit, maybe more of a, a risk-free manner via syndication. If you're curious about that, feel free to reach out uh, in an email phone call. We'll give that contact um, in a bit. But in 2018, we moved to Multnomah Village, which is where we are right now at the Lucky Lab in Multnomah Village. And we do a whole bunch of real estate related activities. So, you know, thank you so much once again for showing up here. Um, the Home Ownership Pathway Program is really what we're here to highlight and talk about. And home ownership is probably something that everyone has as a desired goal in life. But there, for, for a multitude of reasons, I think more and more people are kind of uh, maybe disgruntled at the idea that owning a house is actually something that they can, they can make happen in their life. And we want to do something about that. So the homeownership pathway program when broken down is essentially for our tenants, it's a special kind of offer we give to them to help them seek uh, home ownership. And we do that. So when you, people sign a lease and they become a tenant, there's obviously a lease period and uh, if you are to violate the term of your lease and leave, you would incur a lease break fee. And what we do is we help our tenants who are looking at uh, purchasing what by using uh, our brokerage and working with our brokerage, we will basically pay for your lease break fee uh, as kind of like a thank you for working with our great brokers. So that's essentially what the home ownership pathway program is in a nutshell. And we just want to help everyone understand the home buying process and make that kind of uh, something that people can really believe in and grasp onto. I just want to reiterate that you can lease with us and break your lease at zero cost if you work with us to buy a house. So you get an asset under your name and you don't even have to worry about the lease break fee. Kind of cool. Uh, just talking a little bit about the values of home ownership. I know a lot of people in here uh, seek real estate assets. Um, there's, especially for a lot of our tenants, there's a first time home buyer incentive. So, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people here have heard about the first time home buyer program. It's an awesome thing to use with your lender. Um, you get to tie in your monthly costs. Rent is something that can change 
over time. Uh, and when you own a property, you solidify that for 30 years most commonly. Um, you get more control over where you live. So I know a lot, I've, I get asked this all the time because I'm a, I'm a portfolio manager. Uh, can I paint my bedroom a different color? Uh, no, you can't, sorry. Well, if you own your house, you can paint it brown if you wanted to. Uh, you build equity, so you're not only controlling where you live, you have an asset working for you and it'll, uh, it'll work long-term. Uh, and you're also investing in your future because if you buy one property, and then you move on to another one and you still own that property. You can rent it out with Uptown Properties. And all of a sudden, you're a landlord and an investor. Uh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, cool. I mean, of course, there's always a lot of objections and concerns that people have when they go to start seeking or start to dive into the idea of home ownership. Um, you know, a common one is I don't have much of a down payment. And if you are talking with the right lending institutions, the right mortgage brokers, they are, they're very creative and good at what they do. And they can help you at least set, set like a game plan in motion to help you overcome whatever kind of barrier you think you have when it comes to a down payment. There's a lot of, I mean, there's always misconceptions that people think they have to come to the table with 20% down. And that's just not the case. There's a lot of three and a half percent down programs and even you know more reduced and adjusted than that. Um, so just overcoming your initial fear of letting someone kind of peer into your finances, which I know is probably scary for just about everybody in this room and frankly, all over the world, probably. Uh, but just letting someone come and help you with like a completely objective perspective is really the first step in like making that dream a reality. Um, if they think that the pre-approval process is extremely cumbersome, you know, they might have some... Uh, that might, they might be right in some regard, but it's actually not bad. People are there to help you and they're going to communicate openly and freely with you. And they really just want to make it, when I'm talking about them, uh, mortgage professionals, they really just want to make it easy for you. So if you just come with a willing spirit and a spirit of cooperation, you know, it's really not uh, a very daunting process. Getting pre-approved is, of course, the first step. Um, otherwise, you don't really know where you stand. And, of course, for situations where credit seems to be an issue, there's always credit repair. There's always things you can do to improve your score. And a lot of the times it's much more simple and straightforward than people have in mind. So once again, finding someone who's willing to help you. And if you do have, um, if any of those resonate with you, please reach out to us and we can help, you know, navigate you towards the right people to talk with in order to kind of get, get those things under control. One thing I wanted to point out about these three objections uh, for people buying houses all these things can be solved if you get started early. Talk to a mortgage professional early on in the process. They'll help you create a game plan for everything, and you'd be surprised how soon you could actually buy a house. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide just because it talks about communication styles. It's important to find a lender that you work well with. Same with a real estate broker or realtor. Uh, just, you know, talk around, talk to your friends, get referrals. And if, like Taylor said, if you need anyone, we have great people to work with. So that first step of just learning about your credit, obviously will seem a little scary and there's just no need for it to be scary. Typically your credit is not quite as bad as you think. And like I kind of mentioned previously, it's a little bit easier perhaps to repair it than you might be thinking as well. So there's really no worry, no need to be worried about your credit. Whatever it is, is what it is. And the, the greatest thing to understand is that you're, there are steps and very pragmatic things you can do to make your credit score much more appealing to lenders so that at the end of the day, you get the best rates and you have the best experience when it comes to purchasing your house at the right terms. So do not worry, do not stress. The right people are going to help you and they're going to frame the situation in, in an objective way so that they can help you as best as possible. If there are things about your credit that you disagree with, there are systems and there are ways in order to dispute those, whatever, whatever those situations look like. Um, disputing errors in your credit is something that you should talk with a mortgage professional about and or just, um, and if that might be uh, a lawyer after that, they are gonna help direct you to the right person in order to dispute errors. Um, building good credit is of course a habit that people should you know, keep and maintain throughout their entire life. 
And knowing um, more or less what derogatory reports are, uh, are looking like, being in tune with your credit, I know is a big deal for people. Uh, if you're scared to look at your credit score, you should probably just look at it, look at it sooner than later. Like Trent said, um, getting started early is the best step you can first take. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different variations of credit scores. Credit scores are compounded with a lot of different metrics. Of course, you know, the poor scores ranging from like 300 to 599 and an excellent 800 plus. Wherever you lay at in that kind of array, there are things you can do to improve those scores. And scores from like 650 plus are typically scores that you're going to get reasonable rates at and make things happen for you when it comes to purchasing real estate. 620. I just had a mortgage professional. 620 and up is even good. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, we are both not mortgage professionals, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. Uh, just know that there's conventional financing, which just got the limit raised. I'm not a mortgage professional, so I'm not going to quote it. 625 confirmed is the new conventional for single family residents. Uh, anything above that is going to be jumbo, like we have on the screen here. Um, it's ever changing. So talk to someone that knows what they're doing. And then there's a bunch of other options, VA, USDA, all seller carried financing. They got bank statement loans nowadays, you name it. Uh, here's a couple of scenarios yeah. that I was going to run us through. Let's check it out. So there are different ways to purchase. I alluded to this a little bit previously where most people have the, uh, just the conception that they have to come to the table with 20% down. That's not true. There's also situations you can come with three and a half percent down. There's many different ways to finance real estate. And let's just look at two really quick. So for example, if you came with 20% down on a $350,000 purchase, of course, it's going to be about $70,000. And at the end of the day, after you work through insurance and you work through, um, you know, taxes, your monthly payment is going to be something like $1,800 or so. So the advantage, of course, to coming to the table with more money is that your monthly payment is perhaps a little bit lower. Oh, no, of course, if you are below that 20% uh, down payment, there's something called prime mortgage insurance that needs to be accounted for. And lending institutions will not lend without that kind of prime mortgage insurance. So if you can look at the right side or the three and a half percent example, you can see the prime mortgage uh, kind of uh, more prime mortgage expense in the red line is 160. $2. That is something that you wouldn't have to pay if that 20% down was completed. So there's just different ways to accomplish the idea of financing property. The same exact scenario, but with three and a half percent down kind of results in a $2,300 payment or so. So differences, you get to keep your cash versus you don't get to keep your cash. Your monthly payment's a little higher or it's a little lower. Whatever suits your needs is whatever suits your needs. There's also conventional loan programs with less than 20% down and that mortgage insurance drops off once you hit a certain level. So again, talk to your mortgage people. All right. Uh, why do this now? Taylor, I, I think you're excited about this one. So I'm going to yeah, take I'm, this one. I'm excited. Well. <laughs> so if you look historically at rates, you can see, you know, back in the 80s, rates did creep up to those 15, 16 I think maybe they even got to as far as 18% interest on loans, which just seems absurd, um, you know, and rates can't stay low forever. Of course, if I had a crystal ball, I, I would tell you what I think rates are going to be, but I don't. Um, I can tell you, I checked today. Uh, I think interest rates were like 3.2 or something like that, 3.3. Um, if you had like a 720 credit score or so, something like that. Um, but if you look at the 80s and you're looking down the barrel at 17 or 18 percent interest versus today at about three percent or three and a half percent interest, worlds of difference there, and you are able to accomplish the payoff of your property much sooner um, and keep that asset. So, if you were to purchase a $450,000 house with 20 percent down, the difference in renting versus owning uh, becomes pretty obvious. So, after two years. If you looked at your costs for renting versus purchasing, you'd kind of reach a break-even point. So if you were planning on 
staying in your property for two plus years, most of the time, I would say that is a green light to probably try and purchase something so you're not just renting because the rent versus own debate is something that will always rage on. But owning a property, owning an asset that you can then turn around and make an income from by renting it out or getting creative with whatever that looks like for you is something that's going to work. So that is kind of a, a two, that two year mark was important. If you click to the next one, this is what it would look like kind of after seven years. The, uh, the savings is about $1,200 a month. And after seven years, you're like plus a hundred thousand dollars on a $450,000 house that you are now paying down your, your uh, mortgage on you're gaining and building equity. So carrying this on all the way, just keep clicking through here. You end up at the end of the 30 year period with, you know, a very sizable kind of $483,000. Bob, what's going on? Yeah, ex essentially that's right. So if you, that does not factor appreciation. That's just simply your rent money doesn't ever come back to you versus your, uh, I mean, that actually, I'm sorry. When I built this, when I was just screenshotting a tool, I did factor in like a 4% appreciation on your house or something like that. Um, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so what Bob is saying, if you're, if you're paying down your loan and you're not paying rent, then you're essentially coming out like this. At the end of the day, you don't get your rent money back, but you do pay down your mortgage if you own it. So it's just better to own your property if you plan on living in it for the long term. Most of the time, that that can be broken down to the break break even point of just two ish to three ish years. So just something to keep in mind there. And even if you don't plan on staying in it longer than two years, you can still rent it out and actually make money every month. Oh, so you're excited about this one too. Yeah. So if you bought a, a home in Portland 10 years ago, you're probably going to pay something like 240 to $250,000 for that. Your down payment would be, you know, 20% of that right under 50,000. Your interest rate was a little higher back then. You can see 6.2%. Uh, the term at 30 years, uh, click, keep clicking through here, but essentially, you know, the median price now in Portland is 505,000. And the monthly payment on something like that would be close to $21, $2,200 with 20% down. Um, so if you were to buy 10 years ago, let's say you'd been renting for the past 10 years. So not only is it going to be more expensive for you to buy that same house, but you also haven't seen on the flip side that appreciation that your house maybe doubled in its, um, in its appraisal. So you don't, get, you don't get the upside of that equity and you've been paying rent and you're not going to get that money back. So it's just important to keep in mind. Uh, this is, I mean, the essentially, if you were to rent 10 years from now, what do you think you'd be paying in rent? There is uh, rent control in Portland. Uh, it is CPI plus uh, 7%. CPI is essentially inflation. The inflation number comes out every year. It's always backdated. So the number for last year, I believe was 2.2%. So essentially rents can be raised 9.2% for the, the uh, 2021 year. Um, we already can pretty much say without a doubt that the interest or sorry, the inflation rate is going to be higher than last year. So you can expect rents to proportionately increase higher. Um, if you're just renting year after year, um, of course that can be different if you have, uh, different relationships with your landlord, but essentially if you were to, if you were paying click one more time, if you were paying a thousand dollars, 10 years from now, you essentially could be paying 2550 um, if it was raised to its maximum every single year for that 10-year period. So that doesn't sound like a very good plan to me. Keep rolling, man. Right on. I mean, so as far as cost predictions go, um, homeowner costs are something that you now have to take into consideration versus renting. When you're renting, you don't have to worry about the costs uh, of things that happen to the home water heaters anything crazy i mean Roofs. there's there's a lot but you can be on top of it and the costs are predictable there's uh depreciation schedules that are created for properties 
for example, most carpets should be probably replaced within six to seven years. So you can, you can give that, you can break that cost down all the way to like, my carpet is costing me $39 a month right now or something like that, if you wish. So it has, however organized you want to be with that, you can know that costs are predictable. Um, and that, you know, of course, chaos can ensue and, you know, floods, but that's what your insurance is for. So being on top of it is important when it comes to owning a home, but just know that there are tools to help you with that. Yeah. Kind of touched on this one earlier, just the whole lifestyle privacy thing. You own where you live, so you can do whatever you want, whatever you so choose with it. Uh, you could have a hot tub in your living room. That's one thing I've always kind of thought about, which would be pretty cool. Uh, there's no inspections that you're subject to like a landlord uh, and, a, and a homeowner would do if you're renting. You don't have to pay pet rent. I know a lot of people like dogs, myself included. Uh, and again, you can do what you want with your home, which would be having a hot tub in your living room. Oops. Uh, building equity, you know, you, I don't, I'm a DIYer kind of personally. I know Bob is too, because he, he's a go-getter. Uh, you can, you have control over the paint colors, the flooring material, kitchen cabinets, all that stuff. Uh, and whenever you put money into your house, you're usually going to see it again. And that's a cool thing when you own your own home. I'm doing it right now, actually. Uh, you know, you're going to see that money again instead of just throwing it away. Um, like Bob kind of touched on earlier, is adding square footage or adding an ADU. He not only added an ADU, uh, he got creative and is willing to lease out land that he owns for a tiny home, which is, that's actually a really cool idea. So kudos to you. So once again, the current market update right now, your median home price is 505,000. Of course, 10 years ago, that was about half. So if you had been a perpetual renter for the last decade, you perhaps, you know, missed out on uh, appreciation, but it's not too bad. It's never too late because home values are not Really, if you look at the time horizon, they're not going to go down, you know, in 50 years, 60 years. So just knowing that you can start becoming a homeowner and gaining that equity instead of basically paying someone's rent and therefore financing their property for them is something that it's important to just understand and start to wrap your mind around. Um, the Portland Metro in, like, as a whole Everyone knows that uh, I think the average appreciation year over year for this year was about 17%. So if you didn't do anything to your house, you gained 17% um, of your home's, I mean, 17% value of your home right off the bat. Um, if you were like a DIYer, like, you know, Trent and Bob and a whole bunch of other people in this room, then perhaps that number was even higher. Um, but you can see there on the, the screen, I won't read out the numbers, but this is just kind of what you're looking at when it comes to the median price um, throughout these counties in Southwest Washington and Oregon. All right, diving back into the home ownership pathway program again. Uh, if you're a tenant of ours and you work with one of our awesome brokers in our office to buy a house, we will pay your lease break fee. So it's awesome to not have to worry about that. Uh, what are the steps in buying a home look like? So like we talked about, talk with your lender. Uh, define your criteria, figure out what you want. It may not even be what you're living in currently. You might want a bigger yard. You might, might, might want a hot tub. Uh, it's up to you. Talk with your real estate professional about that so you're on the same page. Um, again, talk with being, being open and honest with yourself and your, your team around you, your lender and your real estate broker are going to go a long way. Uh, you're going to write an offer. Probably not going to get your first offer accepted. I'll just tell you that right now. Uh, Get an offer accepted, then you're going to submit earnest money, go through that whole process, inspect the property, negotiate any repairs or credits or price reductions that you may need. Uh, the property is going to be appraised for pretty much any purchase that has to do with a bank institution loan. Uh, sign all your closing docs, and then you're going to get keys and uh, move in. Yeah, they're going to move in. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be awesome. Uh, so connecting with your lender, it's important, you know, to find a lender and just be open and honest, like Trent said, because you don't want to go and start house hunting with, uh, without realistic expectations of what you can achieve. So that lender is going to help you define reality. They're going to be also creative in coming up with the best solution for you. 
And it's just important not to be disillusioned when you're going to the market because I've certainly helped clients in the past that have not really seeked out a lender before we started looking at houses. And of course they fell in love with houses that at the end of the day, they just couldn't really make happen. So understanding that, you know, lenders are going to use a combination of metrics in order to determine what you can truly afford because you don't want, at the end of the day, you don't want to have a mortgage that is so cumbersome that, you know, you're having trouble sleeping at night. So it's important to listen to them, trust their, trust their advice. They're going to look at debt to income ratios. So for a very good first step when starting to get into um, looking at purchasing homes is to make sure that your debt to income ratio is below most of the time 50% and that you have good credit scores. We kind of already talked about that. Um, but sh certainly talk with an agent about who they trust as a lender. If you already know someone, um, you know, reach out to them, have a conversation, invite them out and uh, just ask them to help you and be open and honest. Next one, we're not going to spend too much time on, but basically figure out what you want in your home, location, beds, baths, square footage, yard, driveway, garage. Location is a big one. So hot tub in the living room, hot tub in the living room. Uh, but yeah, dial that in, be committed to that. And if you find a house that fits all your criteria, jump on it. Talking with the agent, um, your agent about market conditions is something I can't really stress enough. Um, for anybody who is currently actively trying to purchase a house, I'm sure they've reached, uh, reached out with just, just, just basic stress. Uh, it's a very competitive nature. Something important to keep in mind is that the market uh, is whatever the market is. Right now, uh, inventory levels are at 1.1 months of inventory. And essentially what that means is if no more homes were to be put on the market, then all of the homes would quote unquote sell out in 1.1 months, which is a very low number. Uh, typically a balanced market is about five months. So with that information, you, you know that once the house that you, that kind of checks all your boxes when you've defined your criteria comes up, you need to like put your best foot forward and you should really you know, talk with your agent about the best strategy to making that house become yours. Um, interest rates also are something that affects demand in the market. For example, if low interest rates, kind of like what we see right now, are a reality, people are more, they can buy more house. So you're going to see more bidding wars. People are going to come with uh, a lot of offers to homes, which is what we've seen at least over the past couple of years. So Talking with your agent and asking them, hey, where do I need to be to really get this house? Um, because sellers have, uh, you know, one prerogative in mind typically, and that's to get the most money for their house. And to just be realistic with where you stand is important. After you got all that out of the way, which is very important, determine a, a house that you're going to want to ride an offer on, figure out purchase price, terms, and conditions with your real estate professional and submit an offer. Uh, if you get an accepted offer, that's when you're gonna wanna submit earnest money. And you have three business days to do that in the state of Oregon. Uh, this basically just shows that you're in the game. It's money that is kind of non-refundable, but it really is if, as long as you follow the contract. Yeah, and you for sure want to inspect your property. It's important to know what you're getting yourself into. So this is just part of the home buying process. Um, I, we all recommend getting your property inspected. Most of the time, uh, common inspections are, you know, uh, sewer scopes, just general home inspections, making sure the roof is in good condition. Uh, radon, for folks who aren't really familiar with radon, it is the breakdown of uh, uranium in the earth, which causes a very poisonous, odorless, like invisible gas, which can uh, really mess mess you up, uh, lung cancer and stuff like that. So you definitely want to get that inspected, make sure the radon levels are in good condition. Um, older homes might have oil tanks that uh, were used to heat the home in, in you know, the early 20s, all the way even through 50s and 60s. So you want to make sure oil tanks are scanned. If there's septic on site, you want to get that inspected as well. So inspecting your property is just something you, you, re you really should do to make sure that what you're purchasing is what uh, is, is basically worth it and not going to be a big headache later on. After inspections, you're going to negotiate any repairs or credits that may 
need to be given to the buyer. Uh, one way to approach it is asking for the seller to do the repairs. Um, oftentimes, especially in the last three, four years, we've seen a lot of cases where uh, sellers just don't want to do repairs. Maybe you're asking for a credit or lower the purchase price, maybe some different terms. Um, just it kind of is what it is to get the deal done. So be willing and open to have a discussion with your sellers. You're going to get your property appraised. And once again, uh, for, for any time you're going to be borrowing money to purchase a property, the bank or the lending institution, they want to know that the property's worth uh, what you're paying for it. So they're going to have an appraiser, someone who is licensed and does this full time, go and check the property out and make sure that it is like worth what you're paying for it. Um, in the market right now, it's competitive. Uh, and a competitive advantage when you are writing offers is to put something in called like an appraisal waiver or contingency. So if there is a discrepancy and the appraisal comes in less than what you're offering for it, you are going to say something like, I will cover the difference or um, something along those lines. Because of course, a lending institution or a bank won't give you more money than the appraisal comes back at. Now we're gonna sign closing docs. This is basically when you meet with your amazing title officer at Lawyer's Title to sign all your final loan docs and all of that fun stuff. There's about, I don't know, 80, 90 signatures sometimes. So get your hands ready. And then you're gonna collect keys. So once uh, the property is closed and recorded with the local municipality, uh, you're gonna be able to get keys and start moving in. Another common practice in today's market has been an adjusted or negotiated closing or, or not closing, but possession date. Um, since it is so hard for sellers to find their own house to move into, a lot of people are offering rent backs for the sellers to allow them time to find their own place to purchase and move into. So you might not always be able to get possession on the day that you close and record, but you'll get possession eventually, I promise. That's pretty much all we got. That's our homeownership pathway program. I appreciate everyone coming out this evening. Oh, timeout. Terry, Terry has something for us. Who's doing it? I got it. Where is it? I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> 1.1 1 .1 months of inventory. <laughs> Houses are flying off the shelf. Uh, another shout out to Bob, Jan, and Terry this evening. Alec, yep, Alec, rates are going up. The jumbo or the conventional loan limits just got raised. 625, right? Uh, fourplex is like 1.2, isn't it? Yeah, whoa. Whoa, a lot of opportunity.